Thanks for joining us today here in the Building 9 mock-up facility. With us, veteran astronaut Mike Fink, who has spent more days in space than any other U.S. astronaut, and who has had the privilege of launching twice and landing twice in this vehicle, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Mike's going to take us through a little walk on each of the sections of the Soyuz today before we go inside for a look-see. Mike? Rob, it's great to be here, and uh, it's great to get a chance to talk about one of my spav favorite spacecraft, the Soyuz comes in three parts. It's a classic spacecraft, uh, a capsule-based design. So in the middle part, let's talk about that first. That's where we sit in for launch and landing. So we call that the crew module. And uh, right above it, we have the habitation module so that when uh, we actually get into space, we need a little bit more room so we're not cramped in that little can. Uh, so we have the habitation module. And a third module below is the instrumentation module, which has extra things like oxygen and our engines and things like that. Now, just before landing, all three of these modules separate, and only the part in the middle where we're sitting is the one that comes back home. Well, let's take a look inside, Mike. Yeah, come on inside. Rob, this is a, a mock-up of a Soyuz model TMA, and uh, the A part came uh, in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, when we put in this new glass cockpit, the Neptune panel. And uh, so we, uh, we're sitting down, I'm sitting down in the flight engineer spot, which is at the left seat. And then there is the center seater, uh, who is the commander. And then you're sitting in the right seater position, which is uh, either uh, another flight engineer, flight engineer number two, or a uh, space flight participant. So uh, you can see on that side, there are fewer buttons to push and a fewer things to control. So usually the spacecraft is flown uh, with the commander and the flight engineer, which is more like a co-pilot working together. And since the, ce the center seat is, is depressed a little bit lower, it's harder for the commander to actually push the buttons. So either he uses a stick like this, or oftentimes, the way that uh, I've flown it, is uh, as a flight engineer, I push all the buttons, I set everything up, commander agrees or disagree, and then we, uh, we execute. You can see there's a, uh, a screen right here that's a periscope that looks uh, out either in front of the vehicle or, or below us as well as uh, uh, some control sticks here so we can actually manually fly from the center seat. So let's say we're at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. It's launch day. Uh, the crew has had breakfast at their resident crew quarters. Uh, you've gone out uh, into the Cosmodrome to suit up, and now you're at the launch pad. Yeah. How do you get inside this, this uh, efficient vehicle and uh, get settled in for the rest of the countdown? The, the launch pad that I launched off of twice was Yuri Gagarin's launch pad. And how cool is that to have, have people from all over the world, including Americans, launching from Yuri's launch pad? So about uh, two and a half hours before launch, we, uh, we arrive by bus already dressed in our spacesuits. We climb up the, uh, a ladder to the gantry, take a small elevator up to the tippy top. And uh, the rocket doesn't look so big from below. But when you're up there at the, at the, up at the tippy top of the rocket looking down, it's a big rocket. Uh, we uh, come in through the uh, living and habitation module, and there's a hatch right up, up here that we actually come through. So the hatch that you see behind us doesn't really exist. It's great for the mock-up. So we, we uh, send down usually the flight engineer first, then uh, over to the flight engineer number two, or space flight participant, and then this commander comes in last. We close the hatch. We uh, turn on the panels, we uh, turn on the spacecraft, make sure all the systems are working, do our communications checks, and uh, then we sit back and let the ground team do their job. The Soyuz booster rocket that uh, the spacecraft is perched uh, on top of is fully fueled, ready to go. What are some of the things that take place, let's say, in the final 30 minutes or so before uh, liftoff? Usually, uh, up to that point, uh, uh, we have uh, been relaxing. Uh, if all the comm checks went well, the pressurization of the capsule, our suit checks, if that all goes well, then we're just sitting down relaxing. And uh, sometimes they even put in some, some music. And it's uh, very uh, amazing to sit there on the steppe of Kazakhstan listening to uh, maybe some American jazz right before a launch. So about half an hour, though, we get, we get our head back in the game and uh, we uh, make sure all of our systems are, are, uh, are functioning properly, do some more comm checks with the ground, make sure that they hear us, they'll, tell, they'll give us an update, and then by that time, it's time to go. 
and it's just uh, starting to, uh, you know, you start, you can't believe, because up to that point, you're, you say, wow, I've been training for years, ready to go, and the, you can see the little counter go, start to go down a little bit, so, oh my goodness, we're, we're, it's gonna happen. And then you hear some, a few thumps or bumps outside as the gantry moves, and uh, you're, you're standing there all by yourself, and then you can feel the vibration of the engine start to launch. And then the beauty of it all, is eight and a half minutes later, you're in orbit, it's that fast. And then, Mike, conversely, uh, after about six months in orbit, it's time to come home at some point, back to Kazakhstan. Uh, walk us through uh, the preparations that you all uh, do when it's time to undock, and uh, give us a little uh, glimpse of what that entry is all about. We close the hatch between the, uh, well, we get back in our spacesuits, then we close the hatch to the, uh, uh, the living habitation module. We get back here in the, in the crew module, the descent module. And we're all in our spacesuits again. We make sure that, the, that this hatch, especially the one between the living habitation module and the, uh, and the crew module here, is very fully sealed. Because all of a sudden that hatch is going to be the one to the outside because those, our three compartments break apart. So we uh, get ready for undocking to the space station. We're in our spacesuits. Everything's good. And we, uh, we watch the undocking. It's all automatic. Uh, we make sure that uh, we're pointing away from the space. You know, we away from the space station, make sure we get out of the space station's way, and uh, we check out all of our systems to make sure that we can come back home safely. Again, it's always about checking out our systems. It's really tricky because we're going 17,500 miles an hour, and we're going to go back to zero, and we're going to do that by breaking through the air. So that means you know, using the air to slow us down. It generates a lot of heat. Our heat shield not just glows, it actually melts off. It's an ablative heat shield. Our whole capsule is, is coated in it. And uh, it's just amazing because once we uh, do our deorbit burn, uh, that's really important. It takes about three minutes to slow down. But once we hit the atmosphere and start to slow down, it's just an amazing ride. You can look right out the windows and you can see the ablative heat shields melting. You can see the plasma ball that you're traveling through and you're slowing down. And uh, we start you know, hit, hitting the atmosphere like in Central Africa. And by the time we reach Central Asia, if you travel north and east, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, we're slowed down enough that parachutes can pop out and we, gent we drift gently to the earth below. But that parachute deployment is almost like the e-ticket of the ride, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, I know some uh, rides at amusement parks where people pay money for that. Uh, because our parachute, uh, because we have this hatch here, our parachute's actually off to the side. So when it first pops out, we're, we kind of swing around in a big arc. And we haven't had gravity for a long time, and all of a sudden we're swinging around in a big circle. So, uh, and that comes right after, you know, after the, the, the screaming in through the atmosphere and, and breaking up to pulling up to six Gs and all of a sudden we're spinning around with the parachute. But then the parachute repositions itself and it then becomes a kind of a normal parachute and we slow down and then it's just a, a, a gentle drifting. But until then, it's pretty exciting. Until <laughs> uh, the, the last meter or so, the last three feet, as when we meet the ground, uh, we're going about 20 miles an hour at the time, and we hit the hit the earth uh, firmly, and uh, and we know that we're back home. There are engines that fire right uh, a split second before touchdown, uh, almost strangely named soft landing engines, but we're lying on what would be custom uh, seat liners that have some cushion capability for you, right? It's a uh, the Russian designers have tried to make it as safe. As possible, so that we can come back, come back safely and gently, so nobody gets hurt. So they do slow us down with our uh, with our retro rockets right in the last meter or so. These seats actually right before landing. In fact, that's what how you know that you're getting close to the ground. They kind of uh, position up so they would uh, so that uh, as soon as we land, the shock absorber uh, takes the, the the bulk of the the impact. Now, once you're down on the ground, those of us uh, who have been uh, flying in helicopters, Russian helicopters, in a racetrack pattern around the landing site waiting for you, uh, we will land in sequential fashion, and then the process uh, begins to extract the crew. Take us uh, through that. Well, it's always comforting because on the way down, especially under the parachutes, we're able to talk to the, the pilots of the, of the air, airplanes and the, and the helicopters so they know where to find us. And that's uh, very comforting to know once we hit the ground that there's going to be someone there to meet us. So uh, after we hit the ground, we actually uh, have a, uh, uh, a switch on the commander's uh, side here that cuts the risers to the parachute so the wind isn't pulling us around. 
and we sit there and wait uh, carefully. And then this hatch, which used to go up to another module, now opens up to the outside. Uh, the ground rescue team opens it up and uh, takes us takes us out. Of course, it's kind of crowded in here, so sometimes they have to move some uh, some payload or, or some of our survival equipment out of the way first, and then they pull out the commander, and then the flight engineer number two, and then, of course, last but not least, me, the flight engineer. It must be almost a sensory overload. Uh, after six months uh, in a vacuum environment, basically, uh, up on the space station, the smell of fresh air, the look of the grass, the smell of the dirt down in Kazakhstan, uh, what are those uh, sensations like for you? All of those sensations, Rob, are, are heightened by our emotional feeling of coming back home. And uh, as they say in the movies, there's no place like home. And you, you're coming back to, to Earth, you're coming back to gravity. All these, all these things, they're not new to us, but we haven't had them in a while. So there, it's, it's kind of like re, rediscovering things all over again, rediscovering the sense of smell and how beautiful it smells in the outdoors on the step, how it is to, uh, how it is to they hand us an apple right after we land just to, just to give us a, a, a taste, a, a scent of, of, of Mother Earth. Back on Earth, Mike, uh, and we appreciate your time as always, and thanks for walking us through a trip in the Soyuz. I'm really glad to, to be able to share this great adventure with uh, all of our viewers out there. You're watching NASA TV.